welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. The price, only $197. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. My pleasure to welcome Bobby Casey to the show. He is coming to us from Europe today, and he is the Managing Director for Global Wealth Protection, LLC. Asset Protection Services is what we're talking about today. And Bobby, welcome. How are you? Hey, Jason. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So you are originally from North Carolina, right? Yeah, you got it. I was born in Greensboro. Fantastic. But you're living in Latvia, in, in, in the city of Riga now, right? Capital city of Riga. Yeah, I live right in the center, center of basically just outside of Old Town. Well, it is a beautiful place. I've been there before. I was there, I guess, about three years ago and, and really enjoyed it. How, how long have you lived outside of the U.S., just out of curiosity? Oh, let's see. I guess almost four years now. I think that's right. And what prompted you to move? I was a bit dissatisfied, I suppose, with the, the way things were going in the U.S., both, both politically and economically. And, you know, that was, let's say, the, the catalyst. But before that, my wife and I had been discussing moving abroad and living in a different country for a while anyway, just some cultural education and experience for us and the kids. So we just said, what the heck? We bought a one-way plane ticket and took off. Sounds good. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, wh- what is it your company does? I mean, were you in the same business when you were back in North Carolina, or did you start this business when you moved? Well, so I'm 38 years old. I started my first, let's say, real company when I was 21. I've actually never really had a job, per se. I've always been uh, self-employed in some way, shape, or form. But I ran that company for many years. It was in the consumer services business in the U.S. We were an installation service provider across the U.S., about two-thirds of the U.S., and we got involved in some other investments, real estate and restaurant business and stuff like that. And I got involved in the asset protection business. Like a lot of a lot of people get involved in their business. They more or less uh, see a need and they fill it. And I saw a need because I had acquired a lot of assets and I felt like I was at risk. So I started this uh, let's say informally around 10, 11 years, 11 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. Now I started this informally on a consulting basis with, with some people I knew. And formally I started Global Wealth Protection in 2008 after I sold uh, my other companies. And what countries do you specialize in? I mean, you set up entities that are outside of the United States, and I, I suppose they're IBCs, International Business Corporations. Is that what you call them? Uh, we do a lot of IBCs. Uh, our company does a lot of things. It's all, let's say, revolving around asset protection and offshore planning. So, for example, I have one business partner that manages our conference business. And Steve basically is, he owns that project and we do offshore conferences like our next one in Panama in September. And then I've got uh, another business partner, Adam, that handles all of our U.S. structures, like for our real estate investment clients who are, let's say, U.S. centric that have all their rental houses or commercial properties or whatever in the U.S. He deals with our U.S. domestic structures. I deal primarily with the offshore structures in the business and that can be Offshore LLCs, IBCs, offshore trusts, banking, some other creative strategies, let's say foundations, that sort of thing. But I think, and the second part there, you also asked about 
jurisdictions, right? Where do yeah. we do them? Yeah, where do you do them? And, and, and you know, I want to ask you why you do them in these particular jurisdictions. Okay, well, we have relationships with partners in all the countries where all the different havens, let's call them, where we do business. For offshore IBCs, probably our number one jurisdiction is Seychelles. Seychelles is very good. It's a very private jurisdiction. It's actually against the law there for anybody in the government or another agent, registered agent, to disclose any membership, ownership, or management information about a company. So they they can actually go to prison there if they hand over a director or member's name in a company. So it's a very private jurisdiction in Seychelles. It's also a relatively low cost place to set up an offshore company. So a lot of my clients, especially like maybe somebody who's just jumping into the offshore world, they like to say, well, let's just kind of stick our toe in. Well, Seychelles is an excellent place to set up an IBC to kind of get started. Um, But quite frankly, it's excellent if you're You've been doing it for 10 years, too, and you just want to set up your company outside of the U.S. But we also do uh, offshore companies in Nevis, in Belize, Cook Islands, uh, New Zealand, and a, and a few others, but those are the main ones. Now, now, th- th- just a question on that. So many people I interview on this show and just talk to around the world, a lot of them like the Cook Islands, the Cayman Islands. Those are sort of the famous places. Nobody talks about Switzerland anymore too much. Uh, you well, know, Americans we're... can't bank in Switzerland. Anymore. Right, There's, right. No, there's I know, almost since the no UB... opportunity anymore. Yeah, since the UBS scandal, or not scandal, but crackdown, I guess. Why don't you like, say, Cook or Cayman? Because those are two very popular ones. I just thought I'd ask you on those. I thought I said Cook Islands, but I, I oh. may not have. I may not have. But Cook Islands is actually one of my most popular jurisdictions. Cook Islands is fantastic uh, for an offshore trust. I really only do trust anymore in Cook Islands or New Zealand, depending on the client's needs. I can do trust in like Belize and Nevis and others and and foundations and Seychelles. But for the most part now, I'm directing all my clients to trust in either Cook Islands or New Zealand. Cook Islands is excellent because they don't actually recognize any foreign judgments. So, for example, let's say you're sued for whatever, a million bucks here in the United States and – uh, your creditor finds out all of your assets are in a trust in Cook Islands. Well, Cook Islands won't recognize that foreign judgment. They'll actually have to sue you locally in Cook Islands, and that's almost impossible unless the action that caused the litigation occurred in the Cook Islands. Or, you know, and of course, maybe you're if you were a criminal or something like that, they might they might bend to political pressure. But at this point, Cook Islands is one of the few jurisdictions in the world that has actually been attacked by U.S. government agencies and rem- uh, retain their clients' privacies 100% at this point. And what about Caymans? I don't really deal with Cayman Islands at all, to be honest. It's very popular, and that's part of the reason I don't deal with it. You probably read on the news, or maybe you, you saw on the news, it's been a couple of years ago now, but there was something like 7,000 businesses with the same registered address in Caymans and of course, Obama made a big deal about this on the news that that Caymans was this huge offshore tax haven and it was just a bunch of fake companies down there so that people could hide money, which is ironic if you consider Delaware as the biggest tax haven in the world with you know hundreds of thousands of companies. I think there was one address in Delaware, one registered agent in Delaware that had something like 60,000 companies registered to the same address. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's in the U.S., so it must be okay then. And well, the, yeah, the, the, the corporatocracy has basically bought Obama off, just like the, the, the slackers in the welfare state and the unions, you know, so it's uh, obviously yeah. a conflict of interest. <laughs> yeah. But lest we get off on a political tangent here, I apologize. So, uh, okay, so those are the ones you like. Now, take people through what's in, it's, first of all, I guess my first question is, are these operating companies or holding companies, or do you want to make any type of distinction there? Well, it really depends on the client's needs. I mean, I get a lot of clients who are either, well, let me back up, probably 50 or so or a little greater than 50% of my client base is Americans. And so the rest are, who knows where, Australians, Europeans, Russians. And so I get a lot of more than half of my client base is Americans. But of those Americans, a lot of them are either expat Americans or they want to soon become expat Americans. Now, I'm not really saying that is a trend, although I think it probably is, but I'm saying because of who I am and what I write about my client base, that's kind of 
the type of client that gravitates towards my service offerings. So I get a lot of clients who are really expats or want to be expats. And so frequently it's just their, uh, their operating business. For example, before I uh, got on the phone with you today, I was talking to a guy who wants to set up uh, a company outside of the U.S. We're trying to figure out what's the best thing for him. And the reason is him and his wife and his kids, they are about to move to Central America. They're seriously contemplating a move to Panama. And they want to set up their business because he does some consulting and then they have an online business too. And so it's an operating business in that sense. Now, a lot of, a lot of my clients, they say, Hey, you know, I, I don't want to leave the U S I don't, I don't want to do, you know, I don't want to move outside of the U S I don't want to do business outside of the U S but I've got, let's say $500,000 or 2 million or 10 million or whatever. And I'm uncomfortable leaving all my assets tied up in the U S or, denominated in U.S. dollars, and I want to get some uh, geopolitical diversification for my assets, and so let's let's move them outside of the U.S. In that case, it's more of a holding company, right, because it's just holding investments, and maybe they buy stocks and bonds through a brokerage account, or I don't know, maybe they're buying condos in Panama for all I know. Sure, so. sure. Okay, so how much does it, what, what, I guess, what is the first thing one would want to do if someone listening is new at this, but they want that same thing? They want some geopolitical diversification. They may want to denominate in other currencies as well. And if they want to do that, what is the sort of the first thing they'd want to do? An IBC, an international business corporation, or would they want to do something else? Well, for, so first of all, I don't do tax planning. So that'll be my disclaimer there. I don't do tax planning with clients because, quite frankly, it, it's it's just too – I mean, well, give me a break. Who, who, who actually knows the tax code? And even if you took time to learn it, the U.S. tax code, even if you took time to learn it, by the time you finished reading it, it would have changed anyway, right? So I don't do tax planning because that's not really our forte. We more or less – for the planning pr process, we do the structures. And so – but with that said, we do try to help our clients with properly structuring their business so they don't get in trouble tax-wise. So, for example, an IBC is an ideal scenario for an operating business, for example. But if you just want to hold, let's say, a brokerage account, for example, and you want to trade stocks and bonds, but you're going to continue to live inside the U.S., it's not really an ideal scenario. You probably, it, it could, I mean, it can work, and I'm fairly certain there's ways you can elect to have an IBC taxed as a disregarded entity, so it can just pass through to you personally, but it can complicate things a little bit. If that's your, if that's what your end game is for your money, you, you may be better off just uh, using an LLC, let's say a uh, Cook Islands LLC, for example, and holding a brokerage account in that company name. Okay. But brokerage account though, huh? Not what if you want to invest in real estate? What if you want to do, you know, say U.S. real estate or U.S. hard money lending with a foreign corporation though, or a foreign entity, I should say, not a necessarily a corporation. I would, I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't recommend my clients to do that. The problem is, let's say you wanted to buy... I don't know, five rental houses in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense to put that property in, let's say, a Nevis LLC, for example, because, I mean, let's be honest, you, the, the property, you're, you're not going to dig them up and move them offshore, right? I mean, so you, you, it's, it's, not a, it's not a movable asset. And so there, there are also some tax, negative tax consequences uh, for passive investments in the U.S. held by an offshore entity. So typically, that's not a good idea. For If you're buying U.S. domestic real estate, then you need to, you really need U.S. structures for that. Now, with that said, let's say you wanted to buy a 20-unit apartment building in Atlanta. You might put that inside of an LLC, let's say a Wyoming LLC, for example. Right. I like and, Wyoming, by the way, yeah. Well, that, that's one of my favorite jurisdictions, actually, for LLCs. That's typically where we direct clients for LLCs. And it, so, so you may want to put your Atlanta apartment building in a Wyoming LLC, but then you can actually wrap up the LLC inside of an offshore trust if you wanted. For example, you could put it in a Cook Islands trust or a, you know, a New Zealand trust or something like that, because then ownership is outside of the U.S., but it doesn't complicate the ownership picture domestically. And explain the difference, if you would, between, I guess there are three types of structures we're talking about internationally, right? It sounds like we're talking about an IBC, International Business Corporation, we're talking about LLCs, and then we're also talking about trust, right? Three things? 
And also foundations. And also. foundations. Okay. So let's leave the foundations out of it because that's probably for wealthier clients. Now, I have a foundation that I set up when I sold my last company. It's based in the U.S., but maybe let's not do the foundation thing right now. Just we'll, we'll keep it a little simpler. Of these okay. three structures that you that we, we mentioned, the International Business Corporation, LLC, and Trust, explain the difference and why someone would use one over the other. So like I said before, an IBC is excellent for an operating company. I think it's also okay for, let's say, somebody that's living outside of the U.S. that makes their living as a a day trader or an options trader or something like that, and they derive their income from that. Like I have a very good friend of mine, an American guy that lives in Europe, and that's his living. He makes a couple of hundred bucks a day day trading. And for him, that's not passive income. That's active income. And so what he does is he earns, uh, I mean, obviously fluctuates, but let's say 80 to $200,000 a year, depending on the year. And he earns the majority of his money day trading. And so for him, it's an ideal solution to put uh, his trading account inside of an IBC. And then he can pay himself a salary from his IBC of $95,000. And then that become you know, and he gets that earned income exclusion on 95,000. And then he also gets a housing deduction of uh, where he lives, I think something like $55,000. So it's a good way for him tax wise. And then it also gives a little bit of privacy for his trading account and some asset protection if he ever did have a creditor trying to attack it. So in his case, basically use an offshore IBC with a brokerage account in another country. Now, if I was trading or or I, I might would use an LLC, let's say a Cook Islands LLC, for example, if I wanted to have an investment portfolio, either managed or self-managed, but I still lived in the U.S., I would probably use an, an offshore LLC. I might also consider using an offshore LLC if I was going to own investment real estate as a passive investment vehicle. Now, if I were using it as a managed investment vehicle, for example, I personally lived in Panama, for example, and owned, let's say, 20 rental condos, and I was the property manager, and that's how I earned my living, I might set that up in an IBC because that would be active income. A trust is a little bit different. Uh, and a lot of people have a hard time with the trust. Everybody in the world's probably heard of one. It's the oldest known structure. I mean, it's I guess it started originally started back in Roman times when you know the guy went away to war and he wanted his neighbor to take care of his land and his wife and his kids while he was gone. And basically, they signed a contract to put his assets in trust while he was gone to war, right? And his beneficiaries being maybe his wife and kids. But our trust trust law, most trust law in the, in the world now is based on British trust law from a few hundred years ago. And a trust is nothing more than a contract. It's not actually an entity, a legal entity. A trust is, you register it, so it's not exactly, it's kind of a hybrid sort of thing. But it's it's more or less a contract between counterparties. So you have a grantor or a settler, the one that puts the asset into the trust. Then you have a trustee, then you have your beneficiaries in, in a simplified, in a simplified example. And more or less, a trust is something, if you want to get the assets completely out of your name, you don't want to own it anymore, but you still want to have some control and beneficial use of it, then that's when you use a trust. And that's, it it can also be an ideal situation if somebody's looking for complete anonymity of their assets, if you want to use a trust with a trust, uh, uh, with a professional trust manager managing your assets. Um, And that way your name is not attached to anything. And so that would be a good scenario. But but do you relinquish well. control of those assets to that trust manager? I mean, that, that can be pretty scary, I, I think, don't you? Yeah, it is. And that's, see, that's what people have a problem with. And rightly so, especially if you're, <laughs> you're, if you're ignorant to that process, then yeah, it's, it, it's a little bit of a scary situation because gosh, you know, I don't, I don't want to give this Jason Hartman guy control over all my, all my assets. You know, I heard and, he's going to run away with and, all my and, money. And, right? and listen, <laughs> this Jason Hartman guy doesn't want that responsibility either. So, <laughs> right. But yeah, these, exactly. these trust managers that you mentioned, they do, that's what they do. They, they take control of those assets and boy, that just scares the heck out of me. Uh, a lawyer that I was working with wanted to set up a Nevada trust for me, a Nevada spendthrift trust. That was his thing. And you know, you had to, give control of your assets to somebody else. And I thought, oh, you kidding me? That's just scary. <laughs> well, there, there are ways around without giving up your complete control. For example, typically what I do, like, for example, with the Cook Islands Trust, let's say you had an investment portfolio of a million bucks. 
just to make it simple, you got a million dollar trading account and you wanted to keep trading that account, but you want it out of your name, but you didn't really want to give up control. Well, the way you do that, you set up a Cook Island Trust, which owns a Cook Island LLC. So the 100% member of the LLC is the trust, but you're the manager of the LLC. Therefore, you retain the managerial control over the asset and you open the brokerage account in the name of the LLC. So then you retain control over it. You can even have a compensation agreement with the LLC where you get paid some money uh, for managing that asset directly. You can pay yourself all of the profit from it if you want, but you still have full discretion there. So you, you take basically a salary out of the account, right? Yeah. Okay. So, and that salary comes to you living in the United States and then you pay taxes on that money you receive or you don't because it's a foreign entity or you would, you would pay tax if you, so the U S is one of the, well, I guess well, one of two it's countries the most left overreaching. Now. Yes. <laughs> no yeah. Question. I think it's only uh, one of two countries left in the world that still taxes its citizens based on citizenship and not based on a residency. So for example, an American citizen is taxed, on worldwide income, no matter where he lives in the world. So, for example, an American that moves to Canada is still going to pay U.S. tax if he, if he goes over a certain threshold, plus he pays Canadian tax. But but the main thing is he still has to file an income tax return back in the U.S. and Canada. And if he had any investment income or passive income, he has no way to minimize that income tax burden in the U.S. He still has to pay that tax in the U.S. If a Canadian moves to the U.S., he no longer files a Canadian tax return and only pays U.S. tax. So to, to answer your question, if you had an offshore trust paying you a salary from, let's say, Cook Islands, yes, you're going, as an American, you're still going to pay tax on that income. Now, if you lived outside of the U.S., you get that $95,000 earned income exclusion, which is nice. It would be nicer if you didn't have to file a tax return at all, which is as it should be, but that's not the way it is right now. Okay, so what about banking? You know, how does it really work? You set up one of these entities in another country, and you open up a bank account in that country, right? Uh, sometimes, yes. So it, it, it depends. Like, for example, uh, a very common structure, I do, like, I call it the starter kit, so to speak. You asked before, somebody just getting started. It would be either like a, a Nevis LLC or a Seychelles IBC and a bank account in either Latvia or St. Vincent because it's it's a relatively simple, straightforward process. It helps you kind of uh, do some geopolitical diversification. You've got your company in one place and your bank account in another. Right. So it it uh, makes it a little bit difficult, more difficult to to chase the money in that regard if you have some future potential creditor trying to come after your assets. So in some cases, yes, you want to keep the banking in the same jurisdiction as the company. In some cases, no. If you had a trust account, for example, in New Zealand, you'd want the account in New Zealand because your trustee is in New Zealand and, you know, he's obviously, he's not going to deal with a bank in Belize if he's in New Zealand. But if, if you had that trust with a, a trust account at ASB or ANZ Bank in New Zealand, then the trustee, the trust manager there can easily conduct business on your behalf at the bank. But if you're managing it and you've got a good uh, internet bank relationship with the bank, it, it almost doesn't matter as long as the bank is willing to accept an account in your name. Now, that that's getting more and more complicated as an American these days to find bank accounts that will even take you. Because of the Patriot Act. So so you're, you're not going to be able to open an American bank account or you are with this offshore entity, do you think? An American bank account? Yeah, or, or you wouldn't want it in the in American bank at all. You would want it in another bank. But how do you how do you spend the money and access the money? Do you get a a debit card, a, say a Visa card, from that bank in another country? Depends on depends on the bank. Most banks, yeah, you just get a like a Mastercard or a Visa debit card. If it's a corporate account, like in an LLC or an IBC name, in almost all cases, they're going to give you a uh, debit card, Visa, Mastercard, debit card. If it's a trust account, they do not give you Visa, MasterCard because, well, because your trustee is the one that's in control of the account. So you don't want a Visa. You don't want him to have a Visa or MasterCard debit card in his hands, and they're not going to give it to you because you're not supposed to have signature authority over the account. Right, right. Okay, all right. So that needs to be the LLC or the IBC if you want to be able to use a credit card tied to that account and, and use money in it, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you're just dealing, dealing with wire transfers. We'll be back in just a minute. Want to know what you've missed in the Creating Wealth series? 
Well, here's your opportunity with Jason's five book set. That's shows one through 100 through digital download. You save $288 by getting this five book set. Learn all of the advanced strategies for wealth creation. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. How much does all of this cost to set up these different entities? Like, just kind of take us through, you know, a little bit of, of the fee schedule to do all of this stuff. Well, it varies based on the jurisdiction. Some are more costly than others and trust vary, but it can range anywhere from a basic structure setting up, let's say, an offshore company in a bank account range from somewhere in the ballpark of $2,000 on it can go much, much higher, really, depending on how much planning is involved. I mean, I've had some clients that are spending 40, 50, 60 grand to set up all the structures. But typically, if they're spending that much money, this is multiple structures. They have multiple assets. They're segregating assets. Maybe they have real estate here, here, and here. And maybe they need five different bank accounts set up in five different countries. So that's, it gets, it gets a little more complicated. But just for a offshore company and an offshore bank account, it would be somewhere between, let's say, two and three thousand dollars, depending on jurisdiction and bank. If you're looking at an offshore trust, you're looking at anywhere from, let's say, five to, let's say, five to eight thousand dollars. Oh, now, why is why is the trust more expensive? Well, because you have a trustee. Oh, okay. So you've got to pay them. Yeah, I understand. And and what does it cost to maintain these entities? That's that's the thing a lot of people don't really pay attention to. The initial cost, hey, you know, I'll spend three thousand, two, three thousand dollars to set up one entity and you know, maybe I'll do another after I kind of get comfortable with the process. But there there are maintenance costs, right? Yeah, just like just like when you set up your LLC in Nevada or Wyoming or Delaware or whatever, you know, you're gonna pay a couple hundred bucks a year. To maintain them. And then you need to file a tax return in the U.S. for the entity, or you just, or the entity goes on your individual return. I mean, you have to disclose it because, God forbid, you don't want to run afoul of the U.S. government. And, you know, yeah, most of our you listeners definitely don't want to not thing. disclose. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you get in a lot of trouble for that. But are there more accounting fees? I notice every time I set up a new entity within the States, I, I've got to do another tax return. Do you have to do a separate tax return, or how, how is that handled in the U.S.? Well, if it's an LLC, like let's say Nevis LLC, for example. Now, again, I'll give my little disclaimer. I don't do tax planning and tax preparation for clients. So take take what I say tax-wise with a grain of salt because this is – offshore tax planning is so incredibly convoluted that – if if you're going to have offshore companies and offshore investments, you really do need to, like you mentioned, you really do need to factor that into your game plan. I mean, but quite frankly, if if you own a construction company in Austin, Texas, you better have a good tax planner anyway, right? So obviously you need to find a good tax planner who's well-versed in offshore planning issues and he's diligent in his research because it changes all the time. But Typically, like for an offshore LLC, it's treated no different than a domestic LLC that you, if you have partners, you have to file a partnership return. If not, you can treat it as a disregarded entity and it just goes on your uh, your tax return as if it was personal income. So it just flows right through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It just flows right through. Now, if it's if it's an IBC, then it, it gets a bit more complicated than um, I'm I couldn't even begin to tell you because I, I don't have, <laughs> I don't know I don't know how to file those tax return forms. I don't do them either because it's not something I even want to deal with either. But there are some tax forms you have to uh, file more or less like as if you're filing um, corporate tax tax forms. So the uh, so then the offshore LLC is really the the simplest of the three options, right? Yeah, yeah, it it is. And a lot of people they just say, let's go with that, and uh, that's more or less like our starter kit. Let's go with the offshore LLC and and be, because from a tax standpoint it's it's easier. But it, but again it depends. It really it really depends. For example, if you had a a website, for example, like let's say some sort of um subscription website that sold informational products or investment research or something like that and you're making a couple of million dollars a year and the majority of your client base is outside of the US then it makes a heck of a lot more sense to have an IBC and deal with the uh, additional complications because the tax savings can be enormous. 
Right, right. Makes sense. Okay. And well, two last questions, and we've just got a, a couple of minutes here. But do you deal any in any part with the issues of citizenship or dual citizenship or passports, you know, anything like that? Because I know that there are some jurisdictions where if you set up an entity and deposit a certain amount of money, you can gain dual citizenship, get another passport, might come in handy someday, right? Uh, it could definitely come in handy someday for sure. I do not do any immigration consulting. I have a few partners I work with that people call me and say, hey, I really need to get a, I really want to get a second passport somewhere. I have partners that I just refer out, but I, I don't do it. That's not, that's not, that's not part of our forte. Now, the only similarly related thing we do is we do help clients that are interested in getting residency in the EU. So for example, if you buy, uh, and we do this specifically in Latvia where I live. So for example, if you were uh, wanting to invest in real estate in Europe and you had some money, you can buy a piece of real estate here in Riga where I live. And it's a, it's a little less than $200,000 and it gets you permanent residency in Latvia, which is renewable every five years. And that residency gives you basically EU residency, because Latvia is an EU country. So it can lead to citizenship. I don't know that you'd really want citizenship in Latvia because it's a little more complicated. It might be difficult to get, but residency in another country is also a good good thing to have, especially if you're going to uh, be buying real estate offshore anyway. But residency does not give you a passport though, right? It does not. It gives you, you can get a residency ID card, which if you're traveling inside one of the, or inside the 27 EU countries, then you can travel passport free with your ID card though. Okay, last question for you. And of course, I want you to give out your website, tell people where they can learn more. But last question is just on the banking question. I've looked at some of these foreign banks and so forth. And gosh, I did not get a real comfortable feeling about leaving my money there. And I'm sure people have brought that up to you before. What do you say about banking security, banking solvency, FDIC insurance, uh, you know, that you don't have in other countries? Do any of the countries offer any sort of government insurance? Well, of course, the, the U.S. has the FDIC insurance up to 250000 uh, Banks inside the EU have a deposit insurance, depending on the country, but it's between fifty and 100,000 euros. So it, it's, it has to be a minimum of 50000 by EU law, but the country, the member state themselves, can choose their, their maximum on deposit insurance. For example, one of the banks I work with pretty closely, a very good private bank in Latvia, very, very stable, very good bank, no connection, no physical connection in the U.S. And Latvia has 100,000 euro deposit guarantees. But outside of the EU and outside of the U.S., there's not too many places that offer deposit insurance. But with that said, now this is going off on a little bit of a economic tangent, but quite frankly, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing because that FDIC insurance provides incentives for bankers to make really stupid, stupid investments and get their banks in trouble. I mean, you've got banks like Citi in the U.S. Sure, you got $250,000 deposit insurance, but that bank is on on the edge. I mean, they they have almost no 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 bank capital, right? Uh, their reserves are what is it, three or four percent at Citibank. You go to a bank like some of the Caribbean banks, like one of the or one of the big bigger banks I deal with in St. Vincent, they don't even do loans. They have a hundred percent reserve ratio. <laughs> Unbelievable. What a concept. <laughs> yeah, it's a transactional bank. Right. You know, like like banking in the nineteenth century was in the US. It's transactional. You pay fees for your transactions, which means your banking relationship costs a little bit more, but you have zero risk because they don't loan money out. Um, unlike in the U.S. where they loan out 90 plus percent of your money and a, a bank run can put you out of business. Well, but, it's even worse than that in the U.S. because of fractional reserve banking. You know, they're they're loaning out 30 times that. They're creating money out of thin air when they make loans. It's it's just right. it's just insanity what goes on in the U.S. The, the, the games are so complex with the way our, our system works in the States that it's just, just mind-blowing, really. But That's, what were you going to say? Yeah. I was just going to say, that's actually a funny point, the fractional reserve system. I bet 98% of Americans don't understand this very basic concept. But if you take $1,000 and go put it in Bank of America, and for math's sake, let's say they pay you a 1% interest on that, so you're going to make, what, 10 bucks? They'll turn around and loan out at least 10000 and charge you 5% on that. 
on ten thousand and make five hundred. So they have a cost of ten dollars and a and a, a profit of five hundred, and with basically z- zero. I mean, basically, they're just it's just the spread. And mo- most people don't understand the way that fractional reserve system works. It's mind blowing if you really dig in. You, you know, I read a book a few years ago called The History of Money for somebody just trying to figure this stuff out. That'd be a good book to pick up and get a get a concept of it. But banking around the world, you're right. It's it's who knows, but who who knows which bank in the U.S. is going to be any good? My viewpoint is, if you had a million bucks, don't put it all in one bank anyway. Put two or three or four banks, or maybe put some in gold. Maybe buy a condo in Panama and whatever. Spread spread the love. <laughs> yeah, and I looked at those condos in Panama, and I don't know. I like the U.S. real estate. I like lending on U.S. real estate too. But I agree that our our banking system here is a big joke. The thing about U.S. real estate is it's subsidized. It's been subsidized by the U.S. government since the Great Depression. And just I don't know. We can debate that one on another show, maybe. But <laughs> I don't think we'd be debating. We would probably just be agreeing with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, um, Bobby, give out your website if you would, and tell people where they can learn more. Okay. Well. Our core business is Global Wealth Protection, www.globalwealthprotection.com. Again, www.globalwealthprotection.com. And for any of you interested in learning more, uh, we're having a, a very unique educational seminar. I call it the Anti-Conference. It's called Global Escape Hatch. You can find information about that at www.globalescapehatch. Com, and that's coming up in Boca del Toro, Panama in September. And we've got about a dozen or so A-list speakers from all over the world talking about asset protection, offshore planning, banking, second passports, uh, real estate investments, uh, and some other unique investment opportunities. So it, uh, it should be an interesting event. Good stuff. Bobby Casey, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate the info. Yep. Thank you very much. Nice chatting with you today. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.